I, um, I started doing these hikes by myself, um, or with some local friends and I think... So did you have like a home base in the whites or were you just driving up? I was just driving. Shore? Yeah, I was okay. just driving. Wow. I had, um, I had a crappy little Ford Focus that was good on gas, so I didn't really care. Um, gas wasn't $4.50 a gallon, so I was just, you know, screw it, I'm going up every weekend, like... I didn't see my family. <laughs> I feel like I didn't see them for like a whole year on the weekends, but I was just so addicted. And um, when it came time to, so what I did Tecumseh, and then I did Whiteface, Paso Conway, blah blah blah. Um, I think it was either end of October or beginning of November when I it was time for me to do Tom Field and Willie. Um, didn't understand that days got shorter as it got closer to winter. <laughs> uh, so I didn't have a headlamp, but that's okay. I'm not like that anymore. Um, and I... will be the judge of that. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? What am I saying? Broadcasting from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire, welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. All right, we're in episode 68, Stomp. We got our first married couple here. We got our first person that wasn't born in the yeah. U.S. here tonight. This is a big Aside deal. Aside from the uh, little technical. And we've had all kinds of issues with our, our audio, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Now let's keep on talking while we have the chance. <laughs> yep. All right, so. You see what happens when you invite us? Yes, exactly. So we got Susie and Alvaro here, so we won't be talking much tonight, I don't think. Um <laughs> So we stomp just yeah. a couple of topics, and then we'll get to Susie and Alvaro. So social media challenge, culture meets the hiking world with deadly results. Mm-hmm. There was a challenge for um, some hikers to go into a trail that was, what, abandoned or unmarked, that type of thing. So it's a social media challenge. And um, yep. unfortunately, one of the hikers that took up the challenge ended up dying on this trail uh, after he decided to take the challenge. So uh, really a strange twist to this whole culture of internet, TikTok, social media challenges that younger children and and, uh, unfortunately adolescents in their 20s are doing. Uh, What's the rush? I mean, what is there? There's some thrill in doing these challenges. It's um, social media clout stomp. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's pretty twisted. Anyway, so we're yeah. we're down one hiker, unfortunately. Yeah. Exposure and dehydration. A, not a good way to go. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm um I'm still in the doghouse stomp. Oh yeah, how come? Multiple issues. So remember when I was talking about how like the whole trail name thing? Yeah. And my daughter and all this stuff. So during that whole riff, I was like, Yeah, my daughter's nineteen. So she didn't live here anymore. She's in college. So like she's out of sight, out of mind. She's actually 20. So she's got major beef with me now that I didn't even remember that she's, I thought I was, she was 19. I forgot her birthday. Oh boy. Shame. That's, that's rough. Shame. So not only am I in the doghouse over her not having a trail name, but I'm also in the doghouse because I said that she was 19 Shame. when she's really 20. Shame. But I actually tried to get myself out of the doghouse because now her new trail name is 19. Shame. See? Oh, oh, See? <laughs> so she can remember Shame. that fateful moment forever. Shame. Exactly. So Shame. now I have Hawaiian Punch, my nephew. I've got the boyfriend. His name's the Camel. Okay. And then my niece is Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. And then my daughter's 19. So that's my squad. That's my trail family. Okay. And how's your daughter like this new name? She hates it. <laughs> I get the I get the impression she's not going to like any name that's yeah, I don't know. We'll provided to, to her. Susie, do you have a trail name? Kind of. I feel like I don't know. I've had <laughs> like when I first started, 
the whole hiking thing. I don't know. Coming up with a trail name was sort of, you know, just fun. Um, yeah. But I was unfortunately coined the trail name Squeaks. <laughs> um, due to, let's just say, <laughs> you know, you're out in the woods and you're just like one with nature. I know and, where this like, is you're going. you're just comfortable with yourself. And, you know, some flatulence just, you know, comes about. Well, this is already getting as good. This is already getting as good as I thought it was going to get. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 it gets to a point where... It, I should probably be concerned that is, you know, becomes a trail name. An official trail name. Yeah. Luckily, it has dissipated, but you just, you know, <laughs> open up. But it's not. As, as, as far as we know, it is not a <laughs> uh, trail name, I believe. How about you, Alvaro? <laughs> within a within group of people. Alvaro, do you have one? I don't. I'm open for any suggestions. Take Latino. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one, yes. I'll take Latino. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, man. All right. This is already getting good. So um, one of the things Stomp I'm in the doghouse for is so I, I actually want to do a plug for my friend Jen. So um, I've, we've talked about Evan's Notch, tw- I think, two or three episodes. Um, and my friend Jen, who her and her husband are. So she, there's two things that I want to plug for her. One is her and her husband own Evan's Notch Lodge, which basically when you go through 113 and you get into like Gilead and Shelburne in that area, Evans Notch Lodge is like the the hotel right on the, on the right hand side just before you get to Route Two on One Thirteen. So Jen and her husband have bought that place and re and they're rehabbing it, and it's actually a great uh, place. So definitely check it out, Evans Notch Lodge. She gave me a hard time. She's like, I can't believe that you did all these hikes and you never even mentioned um, Evans Notch Lodge in the in the show and then and i was like yeah sorry so i want to give jen a plug so check out evans notch lodge if you want to stay somewhere i don't know if it's like an official like they sort of they do private functions and stuff like that but i think if you reach out to them and you want to stay there like she'll hook you up um and then the other thing is is jen has a podcast called guides gone wild which is all about like hiking and sort of guide culture in new hampshire and maine so it's another podcast again it's called guides gone wild so i'll put that in the show notes and you guys can check it out it's a great podcast sounds good so that gets me out of the doghouse but snob you had a couple of notes here on corrections from the last episode so what do you got yeah basically um in reference to that uh, farm in the western side of New Hampshire on 25 um, in Warren, it's not Meadowbrook, it's Melody Farms. So I just made a little ouchy boo boo on that one. Um, and then, um, yeah, we talked about Lizzie Borden. <laughs> that was actually pretty funny. <laughs> Lizzie Borden versus Hannah Dustin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we were talking about, um, how did that come up? I can't even remember. Um, oh, it was the Lizzie that died on Mount Washington. Oh, correct. Oh, we, the trail. Yeah, they, where they're going to build the, um, the Presby train car system where yeah, Lizzie exactly. died. Yeah, and then we were like, we had said Lizzie Borden, and then... You had said, like, oh, no, that's the one that got kidnapped in Haverhill by the Native Americans. And I said, yeah, but it's really Lizzie Borden was uh, known for suspicious. She was under suspicion for killing her parents or her father and stepmother, I think it was, is the story in Fall River with a hatchet um, or an axe or something like that. And then, and the reason we got this mixed up is because Hannah Dustin, who Stomp had meant to reference, is a woman from Haverhill who was born, you know, in the mid 1800s that was kidnapped by Native Americans. They killed her children, and then she exacted revenge by killing some of her captors with with an axe. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a lot yeah, of axes going there's on. There's a lot of history there. Um, in Haverhill, they still have the statue up, and uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, so. yeah, she's a bit of a controversial figure. Um, eh, not really. <laughs> Only in this culture today, but she was never up until about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, so she's got, there's a statue in Haverhill, and um, the, it's been vandalized a couple of times, but I guess... They're trying to figure out what to do with that at this point. But um, another fun fact is that there is a, a Mount Dustin in uh, Coas County that's named after Hannah. 
And I think mm-hmm. it may be on the 500 highest because I saw that there's a trail report from Danielle had gone up, gone up to that area. But it seems like it's a pretty haul, pretty pretty far haul. Yeah. So th- those are the corrections. We stand corrected. <laughs> Try not to screw up again. So. Um, next up here, Stomp is. I don't know if you've been paying attention to this, but in the uh, the Belknap area, Gunstock Adventure Park. Uh, is closed after they had mass resignations. So, yeah, a very uh, political story. Yeah, I guess. Um, and I don't really know the details that much. As far as I can tell, it seems like it's sort of infighting between some of the state lawmakers. There's some libertarian dudes, there's some free staters. And I think, from what I can understand of this, there is a like a board that oversees the management of the resort functions and then there's a, a team that actually delivers the operational aspects of the resort so the the board is run at the county level and then the leadership team is in charge of basically all the operations and they have oversight from this board there apparently is some guys on the board or some people on the board that like want to push to get gun stock like either privatized or 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 leased out to some private function so they're they're a private entity so they're like it almost sounds like they're sabotaging the running of this to get it from being a public entity into being a private entity but i really don't know all the details if somebody ever wants to message me with the inside scoop that'd be interesting but um it kind of sucks that it's like not available to to be used although I'm not a fan of those like mountain act, those mountain like adventure places like Atatash and Cranmore and those like a, I feel like mm. you're better off taking the kids hiking or something. Yeah, yeah. I I was at a much younger age. I really enjoyed those alpine slides and things like that. But uh, yeah, I agree. It, more bang for your buck, just doing some natural stuff like hitting the rivers or hiking, like you said. Yeah, I think I'm still bitter because I took the kids on that mountain coaster in Atatash and I got stuck behind this lady that kept stopping every like two feet and it was awful. Yeah, yeah. Ever since then I've been bitter. Yeah. Uh, I, I can understand that for sure. Nothing yeah. worse. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on. Um, Stomp, you put in a fatal grizzly attack here. What's going on here? Well, this is a report that came out actually um, regarding an attack uh, that happened last year, actually. And the report basically comes down and says that uh, this was a food-related attack. Um, the night of this attack, there was a, uh, a 65-year-old, Leah Locan of California, and um, the attack took place in Montana, Ovando, Montana, a town with a population fewer than 100 people. And apparently this giant grizzly came into their camp um, one night last July, and they were able to um, shoot away. But unfortunately, the the bear came back later that night and uh, ended up uh, coming into the tent and attacking her, uh, looking for food. Um, so the the purpose of this link is to just demonstrate the different. Um, cautions that you have to take when you're out in that country and uh, obviously they make note of how to manage your food and uh, what to take for protection apparently she um did have a can of bear spray to bed but i mean it just didn't make a difference in this case uh, she died of her in- injuries she um was killed instantly uh, the bear severed her spine and broke her neck Oof. so there you go i guess if you're gonna get attacked like that it's it's probably better to go instantly yeah. So, interesting note. They don't happen around here as often, but you still do have to be cautious when you're camping, for sure. Uh, there have been reports locally of bears and whatnot coming into camp, so just be cautious. Yeah. Um, somebody on the Instagram page, Stomp, had said that they when we, when we say bear, they don't know if we're talking about bear bear or bear bear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of anybody that's been fatally attacked by a an IPA, but <clears throat> it's possible. I'm going to start differentiating <laughs> by saying beer as an IP, IPA and beer as... I feel like it's they're probably talking about me, because I... Is there, is there a different way to say beer that you drink and beer that... Beer? No, I don't think you? so. 
Well, I don't know. What do you guys think, Alvaro? Well, I'm a foreign, so of course I have an accent. <laughs> I, I'll, 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 I'll probably say bear. A bear and a beer. Yeah, why are you asking him? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, yeah. 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 Maybe it's still strange Midwestern folk. <laughs> See, I heard a subtle difference when Alvaro did it, but when I say it, it's the same. Huh. I heard the uh, the difference too, Alvaro. Nice work. Yeah, that was excellent. All right. Um, so stomp on to sponsors. We have a new sponsor? Yeah, we sure do. Yeah, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned this sponsor before, but uh, we're going to make this a little bit more regular. And uh, this is a family business down in Andover. So this is Mrs. Stomp's folks, Dolls and Pops, that... Uh, <laughs> I see. I was tongue-tied as a child. Whenever I say these two words together, I run into trouble. So it's dolls, as in Darlene, and pops. See, there you go. Good job, Stomp. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> it's funny. They came up for the weekend, and we were going to record a little session, but things just got a little late. So, but anyway, Spinner's Pizza Parlor is in Andover, and it's uh, family-owned since 1994, specializing in hand-spun thin-crust Italian pizza with their own homemade sauce. They've been number one in the region for ages, so they're just a few minutes off Route 93, the uh, Dascom Road exit. Stop by, tell them you listen to the podcast. They have stickers. They have all that good stuff. So, um, And also, we have EMS, your Northeast go-to for outdoor gear, guidance, education, and more since 1967. Check them out at EMS.com. And then finally, Reckless at Reckless Brewing. Well, you'll enjoy the best food, craft beer, and fun. Just 15 minutes from Franconia Notch. Many 4K footers in less than 10 minutes from the Five Corners. So James Landoli uh, donated two coffees. Vicky Takes a Hike donated five. Uh, Rev JMG22 donated five. And... Uh, Jeff donated five, and Jeff uh, connected with the Vets in the 48 following one of our episodes, so that's really nice. And then Shandy today just donated three, and she tried to drop a Paris parasite tick joke, which, I don't know, I thought she was our number one fan, Mike, but uh, she must have missed that episode where I dropped that one earlier, so a little disappointed. Oh, so you've already used that, that joke. I've used every tick joke in the book. Really? Well, she redeemed herself because she like she made a comment like I went. I'll talk about the hike up of the Huntington Ravine, but I've been, I've been actually wearing these like these are like they're button up shirts, but they're like wicking type fabric. So I've been wearing these like hiking a lot just because my you know, my neck gets sunburned and it's pretty good and they're comfortable. You can unbutton them if you want. Like, yeah, settle down, Susie. I'm not going to unbutton too much, but um, if it gets hot or whatever. So she was like, she, I posted a picture and on social media and Sandy was like, what kind of outfit are you wearing? Like making fun of my outfit and all my, my family members got a kick out of that. Cause they're like, why are you wearing a button up shirt hiking? But I, I don't know. It's just comfortable. That's like kind of the norm. That's like, what do I you, said. Like, do you get that from like Eddie Bauer? Yeah. It's Eddie Bauer mountain yeah. shirts. I'm yeah. all about Eddie Bauer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think Alvaro has a couple of those. It's an authentic Eddie Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Thanks. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. Like, literally, like, and it's perfect because, like, they're super comfortable, and I wear them for work, too. I'm just, like, I put it on in the morning, and I got my short sleeve shirt, but they don't know it's a short sleeve shirt because I'm only, like, on video. Mm -hmm. So, and then I wear them hiking. So it's the best yeah. when you don't have to spend extra money exactly. on like work outfit and then hiking outfit. That's why, yeah, I, I'm yeah. all about the button ups. Yes, it's two <laughs> two for one there. So, all right, any other coffee talk there, Stomp? No, we're good to go. All right, so welcome to episode 68 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week we are joined by hiking super couple Susie and Alvaro. So both Stomp and I have known Susie and Alvaro for many years now, um, so we wanted them to join us to talk about their various adventures hiking in and around the White Mountains, their travels to Europe, and Alvaro's experience as a guide in New Hampshire, and um, we also wanted to discuss their recent involvement in some rescues. Uh, most recently, I think in Scotland, we're going to break down something that happened to you guys. What have you been up to? Um and then we will also discuss some recent hiking adventures that we've had, including a trip up Huntington Ravine. I got a little bit of White Mountain history I'll throw in on that one. So I'm Mike. 
And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. Let's get started. All right. So first thing we want to do is beer talk. Stomp, you drinking anything good? Oh, well, I had some leftover like Mike's Hard Lemonade from this weekend. So I'm just having some concoction with that and some lemonade and nice, nice and fruity. I'm off the beer thing for a while. I just can't. It's just like, it's too heavy. So I used to Got mix it. that with uh, with vodka back in my day. Mike's? Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, tasty. if you're bored with Mike's. Yeah, that you <laughs> spike it up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Mike's on steroids. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. <laughs> what about you, Susie? you drinking anything? Do you drink? I don't even have No, do I don't. Well... It's funny because I think a lot of my reasoning of being a hiker or whatever you want to call it stems off of not drinking and quitting drinking a few years mm. ago. But um, I do drink non-alcoholic beer. Okay. Um, which, which are getting better and better, by the way. They are, yeah. I mean. They're incredible. They're, there's so many options out yeah. there. I'm actually an ambassador for one of the non-alcoholic beer companies, Athletic mm. Brewing. Oh, oh yeah, um, that, that's actually one that I had during the Lodge to Dodge with uh, Steve, Mason, and Larson. Oh, yeah. Jella. Steve offered me one, and I couldn't believe it. It was absolutely delicious. Yeah, it, it, it's such a great placebo. Like, if you're, you know, especially, I mean, you can still be a drinker, but you, you signed up to be a DD. Mm-hmm. I mean, these... Oh, yeah. It, it tastes exactly like IPA. I mean, I love the taste of beer. Sure. But, um, anyway, I'm drinking athletic brewing right now and it's called zamba mamba which is a very like fruity ipa um not good for summer Uh, ipas aren't really a summer beer but i'm enjoying it near beer i'll check it out and i'll put the link in the show notes for you Mm -hmm. yeah i actually have an um i have a discount code as well i'll share with you guys later on Send it our way. Yeah. We'll get it. Well, they also make awesome stouts. <laughs> so usually that's what I drink. That's what I go for. Um, and because of Susie, you know, just to be supportive, I kind of got into the habit of drinking an alcoholic, alcoholic beers as well. And I was lucky enough that they have great stouts, then I'll call it um, stouts, and usually that's what I drink. So today I'm actually drinking First Ride, uh, extra dark with coffee um, from Athletic Brewing. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good stuff. You can bring for your hikes and um, drink as many while you're working. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, check it out. Well, check it out. And uh, Mrs. Mike just picked up a four pack for me of um, True North. Coast to Coast, which is an American summer IPA. So I think Susie True North is trying to break the um, break into the summer IPA market here. And True North is right down the street from us too. That's in Ipswich, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's you know, not maybe a quarter of a mile away. Oh, nice. Yeah, very cool. Um, all right. Well, uh, that is the the beer talk stomp. Where you been? You've been hiking anywhere recently? No, not at all. I was on um, a rescue or two, and that sort of wiped me out. <laughs> I've been playing recovery here, uh, working out in the hot sun and just like out in the sun forever the last several days. So I'm just really over the the outdoor thing for the time being. Understandable. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, I got out... Um last weekend or this weekend that this past weekend I was like I had sort of milked Evans Notch for everything I could I sort of kicked around the idea of hiking Blueberry Mountain again in Evans Notch just to stay close and really close out all the big hikes there but I was Ian Kenny had sent me uh, Forrest and Crag Guy Waterman's book so I've been reading the early chapters of that and I was mm. reading about the the Belknap mm. Cutler expedition and that motivated me to go back up Huntington Ravine. So I was like reading about the story of some early expeditions on Mount Washington. And I figured like, yeah, let me go back up to Huntington Ravine. And then I also wanted to get, I've been lucky enough this, this um, 
probably this whole year where I haven't really been on any hikes where it was like super crowded. So I was like, well, why don't I go down Tuckerman Ravine and see what's going on on a Saturday morning? So I got some really good stories, I think, from uh, from going down Tuckerman, which is pretty cool. But mm-hmm. to start off with, just to set the stage, this Forrest and Crag book, and Ian, thanks again for sending it over to me. I'm loving it so far. Um it, it talks about some of the early expeditions on Mount Washington. So Darby Field was known as the first person to climb Mount Washington. The theory on Darby is that he basically left from Portsmouth, hiked up to Saco, Maine, followed the Saco River pretty much all the way up to Mount Washington. And then the theory is, is that he likely took the Montalban Range and then made his way along where Davis Path exists right now up to the summit and then back. There's some theories that he might have actually gone up Bootspur. They don't really know. There's an, he, was, he didn't really document mm-hmm. it. I think there's like two or three documents about Darby Field hiking. Um, and he hiked it in like the early 1600s. And there really wasn't much going on for about 150 years after he hiked it. So um, the Belknap Cutler expedition was in the early 1800s, and that comprised of um, Manessa Cutler. And you, you hear this like Cutler River drainage, which is essentially the drainage that feeds down from Huntington Ravine. Mm-hmm. Um and feeds into that like crystal cascade waterfall that you see at the bottom of Huntington um, or Tuckerman Trail. He hiked, he basically was on an expedition with an, a botanist named Jeremy Belknap, who the Belknaps are named after. After um, they actually made their way up from a different direction than Darby Field. Darby had gone up the Saco. They had some, this group had somehow made it up through Pinkham Notch. So they were able to get settled with a base camp in the current location of where Pinkham Notch, Notch exists, right? And then from there, they made their, so they set up camp. They made their ascent from Pinkham Notch. And uh, based on the writing and the documentation from that, that error, the theory is is that they made their way up the current Cutler River drainage. Once they got to the the um, floor of Huntington Ravine, they cut up Nelson Crag. Once they got on top of Nelson Crag, they made their way. It, it became foggy. They lost visibility. Made their way up to the top of Mount Washington. As they're coming back down, they didn't exactly retrace their steps. They ended up descending down Huntington. A little bit until they realized their mistake. They then had to go back up and then find their way down through Nelson Crag. This was all done in a single day from base camp up to Mount Washington, bushwhacking along the Cutler River drainage up Nelson Crag with no trails up to the top of Mount Washington and then back down. So probably a group of, I don't know, six or eight men that made it. Belknap turned around after a mile. He was like, screw this. That's probably why that like smaller mountain range is named after him because he couldn't handle the big ones. <laughs> he turned he turned around a little early. <laughs> I was reading all about this and I was like, I'm going to do Huntington. And I'm going to follow the Cutler River just like those guys did and sort of see what the experience is like. How many miles total for that trip? The hike I did was like 11 miles. I think for them... It would have been probably a little bit longer to come up and down Nelson Crag to get back to Pinkham Notch. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But um, yeah. anyway, my hike, I left the I got to the parking lot at 5.15 in the morning, made my way up Tuckerman Ravine Trail, cut over to Huntington, got some water at the, at the river crossing as I made my way into the ravine floor. Went up past that sign that sort of reminds people about the death of, I forget the name of that guy that died in 1982, and then jumped through the boulder field, got up to the slabs in Huntington. There was a group of climbers to my left that I could hear talking, so they were like probably at like 4,500 feet of elevation, and they were climbing around that area. Eventually, I got above them made my way onto the Alpine Garden. Didn't see it. And the, other than those two climbers, I didn't see a single person. The views were clear all the way out into uh, the south for, you know, 100 miles. There was no no visibility issues. But nice. once I got to um, the ascent of the summit cone 
on Tuckerman when I reconnected from the Alpine Garden. That's where the clouds started rolling in. Got up to the summit. Um, just basically grabbed a picture. There was no lines because the the Cog Railroad was just pulling in as I got up there. And then um, it's all timing. So, yeah, exactly. It was perfect timing. Hung out, had some pizza at like nine in the morning or whatever, eight thirty in the morning up top. Had some candy <laughs> for breakfast. <laughs> One of the through hikers came in. This this guy from the UK named Great Dane gave him a Snickers bar. Was talking to him a little bit about like who's Notch, telling him like what it's like a little bit. He was asking, and then I headed down. Um via i think what is that davis path or crawford path whatever crawford path the davis path i, I forget what right. that heading to the lake of the clouds um and then i just used the tuckerman cut over went down tuckerman's but um that's when i started that's when i started seeing side. like the crowds gulf it's side like, yeah yeah so okay. uh, i don't know i think gulf side is like coming the other direction i think it's davis path that i went down to lake of the clouds well, you have to, yeah, from like to Lake of the Clouds under the summit, well, yeah. it's, it's Gulf side, but then it transitions over. Okay, maybe that's that's the case. I can't remember. I have to look at a map. But anyway, I made it to Tuckerman Cutoff, and then when I got to the top of Tuckerman, that's when the hike completely started changing. First of all, I saw some dude in the parking lot when I left at like 515. It was two guys. One guy had an American flag in his backpack. And they didn't look like hikers, so I was kind of like, oh, I don't know what they're up to. But they were just making their way up Tuckerman when I got to the rim, and one guy wasn't looking good. And then I was talking to the other guy, and I don't know what this this guy was on some mission. I don't know what it was. I didn't get into the details, but he was like, I think, looking to climb it, but they were going to take a, a car down. But I was half waiting for this guy to pass out because he wasn't looking great. Then there was like 10 college dudes smoking a bong right at the top of, of Tuckerman. And they were throwing rocks down on uh, on the, the waterfall. That's then I great. see there's like three of their friends climbing on the waterfall. And one kid takes this like header, scrapes his ass. And like they're, you know, the three of them are trying to make their way down like the waterfall on Tuckerman as I'm hiking down. Um, so it was kind of chaos coming down there. Hmm. I was going to call kids you will be kids. They will. Those crazy kids. <laughs> oh, um, I met a inspirational hiker dude who was, te- who told me that he was an hour and a half ahead of his daughter and son and that they had a dog. And he's like, when you see them, tell them I said to hurry up. So he's telling me this whole story. Meanwhile, like the, 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 the dog Clouds. comes around the corner and like, they're listening to him. Tell me the story. So he gets done telling me the story. And I was like, that's, I'm like, that's them right there. So it was kind of funny. He thought he was being smart and they they walked right up on him. (laughs) Uh, Fun day up in Mount Washington. Yep. I saw a a girl yelling at her mom. Well. About a mile up trail. She wasn't happy. She didn't want to hike. That's understandable. (laughs) Oh, my God. And then the last thing I have on this hike is uh, coming down Tuckerman's, I started to see people with numbers running up the Tuckerman Trail. So I asked one of the guys what's going on. The Sea to Summit Triathlon was going on, which apparently is a mile and a half swim in South Berwick, Maine. Yep. A 91-mile drive or uh, bike ride from Maine to Pinkham, uh, to Wildcat. Yeah. And then a run from Wildcat up to the top of Mount Washington. Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> that's pretty challenging. Yeah. That's a bucket list um, race for you, Stomp. Oh, yeah, I wish. Yeah. That, that That's a little over the top. <laughs> Those days are over. They are. Um, but that's it, Stomp. So, notable listener hike of the week. So, tag Slasher on your adventure, and you'll be considered for the hike of the week. This week, we'll let uh, Mike, Alvaro, and Susie choose the winner. But this is actually a really good uh, good list. So, we have uh, Bobby OC23 did Stairs, Resolution, and Sunset on Crawford. 
Erin Backpacks tackled Speckled after she heard the Evans Notch episode. So there you go, Mike. You're inspiring people. Nice. Vicky. Vicky takes a hike. Canon to finish the summer 48. Now, she, she mentioned summer 48. So I guess what's that? The 48 in all four seasons? Hmm. Pretty cool. Vicky O'Brien did Owl's Head for the yeah. time. Totally. <clears throat> Interesting. That's it. You had me at you had me at Owl's Head. That's crazy. Yeah. You, you got this, Vicky. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> Mike Denley did Frank Ridge. Three Happy Girl did Flume and Libs via Flume Slide for six and seven out of the forty eight. Good job. Nick Seedler crushed several ADKs, including Algonquin and Iroquois Peak, and then Jakester D2 did Wildcats and Carters, but apparently we already have a winner. Owl's Head. Vicky, Vicky O'Brien. Let's eighth time? For Vix. The eighth yeah. time. Oh my God. Yeah. She and I'm either really that... loves hiking or she really loves to like torture herself. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if it's like all at once or consecutive or like spaced out over <laughs> a period oh. of weeks. <laughs> so oh, funny. No. That's pretty hardcore. Boy, did we do Owl's Head? Oh, that is that's an episode in itself. Talking about so. that adventure. Who was it? Was it the four of you, or did anybody? Who else? Who else went on that trip? Uh, Mrs. Stomp, Gina, Badascu, um, yeah, Alpha, yeah, Susie. Yeah. I think uh, that was it. I think I it was just the four it. of us. Yeah, but it was like um, you know, late winter, early spring. The water was high, and. Um, you know, people got, we're going up the icy slide um, up to Owl, the traditional route up, and people were bottlenecked with a dog. We, you know, we had a bushwhack around them at points off of the slide and then on the way down, you know, just trying to determine the best route to go. We ended up going towards the, the water crossings and those became pretty challenging. Um, so it was just a really long, challenging day. Never forget that one. We've had a lot of fun times together. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and we did it right on the last day of winter, just to make sure we didn't have to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. I recall so, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is sort of a nice segue into the first segment. So, um, Alvaro Marks and Susie Marks, you guys were married. I remember when Susie's name was different. It was. It was. Yeah. Many many moons ago. Many moons. Yeah. It's time for Slasher's Guest of the Week. Very cool. Very cool. You guys came into my life probably, what, 2014? 2015, I think it, it was, was related. It was 2015. Yeah, through, yep. through the hiking groups, I believe, yeah. roughly. Yeah. You know, just seeing images of people and saying, oh, and then, you know, seeing them on trail. It was like the infancy of some of those hiking groups, hiking hooligans, um, obnoxious hikers and this and that. So long story short, um, as those groups tend to go, you tend to hike together sometimes. Groups get together and then, you know, you guys started to become hiking family. Uh, same with Mike and myself. And um here we are, this many years later, and uh, so many adventures and stories to tell. That's the start of it all. So yeah, roughly 2015. Yeah. I remember meeting you, Susie, up on, I think it was uh, Field. My, my wife and I were trying to finish the Tom Field Willie, and we met Susie. You were the one who told me about hiking social media groups. I, was, I wasn't part of any. So... Um, that day, I mean, I was pretty new to the whole hiking scene, and I had recently discovered that there was a list called the 48, and, you know, I, I became pretty addicted to hiking them all. Yeah. And, I, yeah, I ran into you and your wife on top of field, and we were just kind of observing all the, the gray jays landing on our hands, and... I don't know, you, you two were up there and we just started talking and you asked me if I was on any social media groups and I said no. And you told me of a couple and I joined them, one of them being Obnoxious Hikers. <laughs> the, yes, yeah, um, okay. And 
That was in um, 2015. Isn't that amazing? So, yeah, we parted ways because you continued down, Willie, and we were a little nervous for you. And my wife and I had just started hiking, I believe, the the summer prior. So, uh, for us, it was a new experience being in the winter conditions. And we were we were like, okay, let's get out of here. Let's save Willie for another day. And then you carried on, and we were a little nervous about you. But then uh, we ended up touching base after the fact, and it was, it was really cool. Yeah, I got down at, I mean, this was late. October, I think, and the sun was already down, but it was still light out, but I was definitely pushing it. Um, I think I finished around 6.30, but it, it was kind of a sketchy way down because it was icy already, and pff, I didn't know what micro spikes were. <laughs> um, <laughs> Back then, I mean, Coming I didn't know it. I, yeah, it, it was, it was, um, I don't think I had a headlamp either, just come to think of nope. it. Nope, nah, that's I was, why we were I was nervous. definitely one of those people, yeah. <laughs> the good old days of a uh, beginner. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm way, I'm much better now, you guys, don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, I survived. I did it. I got my three hikes, I, my, my three peaks, rather, that day. And yeah. yeah, it is so funny how you like you know you you start off relatively unaware of like the basics, and then over time, <laughs> you know you you start to learn. And I think that you know these different groups, you know they had their their definite positive aspects around you know getting to meet really awesome people. And you know one of the other aspects is is that like there's a lot of experienced people that we could learn from as we were kind of coming up. And you know you, you, it limits the amount of mistakes that you make by uh, trial by error. So it's it's, it's great, but. Um, just for the audience's sake, like we've we've all sort of hiked together, we've camped together, and um, you know both Alvaro and Susie have a lot of experience, and we thought that it would be fun to have them come on to talk a little bit about some of their experiences, and then we'll probably get into a little bit about like sort of like hiking couples and stomp we never really talked about you and mrs stomp you guys hike together my wife doesn't hike that much like we'll go occasionally but like uh, it'll be interesting to hear from alvaro and Susie about like sort of hiking couples although i think you guys kind of do your own thing too which will be interesting but i think alvaro we got you on the script here to start with so why don't you um don't talk about how you met Susie. we're gonna let Susie do that piece of it but why don't you introduce yourself give a little bit of background um you know you're not originally born in the u.s so we want to hear the story about how you came to the u.s and then talk a little bit about you know your experience with outdoor adventures and your exposure to the white mountains and how that all came about yeah so i mean i've been here for 11 years now and it feels like a lifetime it's uh it's interesting how things happen i mean uh, i actually came to the u.s uh from spain i was uh, at that point i was living in spain um for about three years and that's where i kind of actually did most of my more serious hikes and even higher you know, elevation mountains uh, was more in spain at that point but uh it was i ended up Coming to the U.S. Um, with a teaching position, I had been applying for several places in in, in Europe, and at some point, a, fr- um, a friend from from college, hey Alvaro, they are um, they're looking for a teacher in in this place called Hudson, Massachusetts, and um, and you might be a good candidate. And the funny thing is that. In 48 hours, everything happened. The interview, the acceptance, um, and this was December 26, I believe, I had the interview, and the next day I was getting the phone call, um, yeah, feel free to uh, book the, um, your flight, you're coming to the U.S., and here I am. 2015? 2011. Oh. 2011. So I met all of you also through you know, those hiking groups, but uh, it took me almost like uh, f- four years to find you guys. I'm glad I did. <laughs> no kidding. So you were like whirlwind. You're, you're um, you get the teaching gig in Hudson, and then did you had you been in the U.S. before? No, no. Actually, I had never been uh, outside of Europe at that point. Um, so there was, and actually, there was the first time that I actually went to uh, an English like um, 
English speaking country as official language. Um, so, uh, what was the motivation? Like, were you, did you feel like you were lost at home and, and you wanted to just sort of find yourself? Or was it like a career thing, or what? What? What motivated you to like do such a drastic lifestyle change? Well, I definitely wanted to travel the world at some point, and um, you know, uh, teaching languages was a good way to kind of travel all over while in, enjoying all the the cool things that we we, we can find in, in different places uh, and that's why I was looking for um, jobs uh, teaching jobs in in different places uh, I actually ended up there were I did send uh, an application to Siberia Tomsk and another one to South Africa <laughs> So he, U.S. got me first. <laughs> well, I think you, I think you hit the lottery. Um, and then when you got to the U.S., what was some of the like? Uh, did you have any struggles, or was it pretty easy to sort of get get acclimated? It, oh, it's it is a cultural shock, definitely. And I was, um, and I, and basically, I moved from Barcelona. So I was living in Barcelona at the time. I'm moving from Barcelona to a small town in Massachusetts. Um, that at that point was not. It's Hudson, Massachusetts. It's in a much better shape now than it was 11 years ago. Um, there's a that town has um, grown so much up, so much life. Um, I'm really happy for them. But I got I get here in the middle of snowstorms, January 18, and. I'm shocked. I'm amazed. I have always wanted to be in a place with a lot of snow, uh, so I was definitely getting all the snow that I I have wished for. Um, and I definitely remember that besides having to start teaching the week after, the very first thing I started looking for was where are the closest mountains, um, and that was definitely one of the things that got me excited. And how long did it take you to get up into the White Mountains? Uh, I would say as soon as I got my first car in the U.S., probably about a month. About a month. So a month and a half. It was pretty cool. Yeah. And um, did you know anything about, like, how did you get, how did you start to learn about sort of the culture of the White Mountains and list hiking and um, the different notches? Like, how long did it take you to kind of get the lay of the land? Oh, it was definitely trial and error. I mean, my very first hike was, so this is February, Lafayette in the winter. I mean, I had been um, hiking and climbing in the Pyrenees in Spain, so I had equipment for um, for the time of the year. But still, I l launched myself into the White Mountains in the winter, and looking back, without much knowledge of weather patterns, um, I was not used uh, at the time to the um, you know, less sunlight during the day. Um, even in terms of uh, the the fauna, I I didn't do much research on that. I was a little bit just let's just go. I just wanted to be in the snow, go to the summit. Uh, but it was an attempt. I did that at a late start, and by the time that I was in the at the Greenleaf Hut, um, I look at the time. I looked up. It was a beautiful day, but I was like, "Yeah, this might be not enough time for me to get up there and go back down um, within the daylight uh, time." So my very first hike was just an attempt. I went. I just went to the Greenleaf Hut, and I think after that, I basically started to also looking for groups. It all started with meetup groups, um, and from that, I met people that introduced me to groups like hooligans, uh, obnoxious hikers, and everything went from there. I guess. Yeah, yeah, and then as far as you know, getting that network built up, eventually. You sort of got the lay of the land around the White Mountains, and you got your network and your crew of friends. Can you talk about like the differences, like when you when you were hiking in the Pyrenees in Europe? Obviously, like the, the, those peaks are huge. Um, 
were you surprised when you got into the White Mountains around, you know, the, the, the difficulties that you, you could get exposed to, even though it's, it's relatively lower elevation? Uh, I mean, a little bit maybe, but um, being from Portugal, we have similar mountain ranges. So I was, I was kind of at least used to that sort of elevation gain with, with mountains only at, 5,000 feet, 6,000 feet. The one thing that were, that I really enjoyed was the fact that there are so many trees <laughs> and not a lot of uh, above tree line uh, to the point I was loving it because we don't have that in Portugal. Um, uh, if you go to our uh, mountain, highest mountain ranges, um, due to mostly due to fires, which are almost similar to what we face in California. Um, yeah, I would say above, above tree line is like two thousand feet sometimes. So hiking here um, and really having to work hard to be up there and enjoy the views in a way it, it's a challenge uh, by itself, and it's uh, it was very enjoyable. If you so for the listeners, if if there was listeners that wanted to take like a trip to Spain or Portugal or anywhere else in Europe, what are some like what are your top two or three picks to go check out for for hiking in in that area of the world? So I'm going to give two um, two takes on this one. One from my old days. I love hiking in Spain. Um, I've done a lot there. Uh, the Pyrenees are amazing, beautiful. If anyone has a chance to go there, uh, the Ordesa in Monte Perdido um, National Park in the Pyrenees is definitely one of the best places to go in Spain. Um, you have these beautiful canyons um, and summits above 10,000 feet. Um, so definitely a great place to go. Great food in Spain as well. So. Uh, and the, the network of huts is pretty affordable and pretty good conditions. And my second um, would be Scotland. So Susie and I were in Scotland very recently, and we are basically in love with Scotland. Um, any Monroe, which is any mountain above 3,000 feet, it's uh, quite a a fun thing to do there it's very green i heard yes definitely it's beautiful awesome um and then how did you adjust to the food here in the u.s so that was not as hard because hudson massachusetts has a big portuguese community okay and that was also one of the reasons why they were looking for um uh, a Portuguese teacher, um, but the the community in Hudson is mostly um, from one of the one of the islands in the Azores, Santa Maria. Okay. I'll say the the big percentage. So besides being able to buy Portuguese products, uh, we also had two Portuguese restaurants, um, and that definitely helped a lot with my transition. Um, so that part was not as hard. Culturally speaking, it was it, it was a cultural shock. I would say the first four months were really hard, um, being used to living in Europe and now in a, a smaller you know, town in the US. Uh, it took me a while to adapt, but you know here I am, eleven years after, so enjoying it. Like you stumbled into all these lunatic hiking friends, like you know that's not representative of what you would normally find in the, you know the U.S. So we apologize. No, I mean, uh, you know, it takes one to recognize others. So I guess I was just I was, I was just looking for my tribe. I guess. Yeah, there you go. Sorry for nothing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so Alvaro, we, so me, you, and Stomp did a Pemi loop, or I bailed on you guys because no. I was like, I got to get back to the camp and like go swimming or something. But um, we did most of a Pemi loop. <laughs> So um, I think that was the first I knew you obviously through social media, but I think that was the first time that we met and hiked together. 
And can you just give your perspective on that trip? And this is the infamous story where Stomp blasted himself with the bear spray. A tenth of a mile in. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, a tenth of a mile in. And tried to pretend like it was no big deal. So can you just give your perspective on that day, Alvaro? It was long, <laughs> for sure. <Yeah. laughs> you know, you started at night, you ended at night. Um, and I definitely remember all those switch, never-ending switchbacks at the end, uh, after the last summit. Uh, and I remember us running, and after all those hours, uh, we were still finding energy to run the last miles down the Osseo Trail and uh, Lincoln Woods just to get there on time. Uh, no, but I, I, we had great fun. I mean, we had sunrise um, at the first month, and we kept going. We had to stop quite a few times um, due to um, you know, some bio breaks. So it's normal. No, we are when when we all get old. That's that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> No, but we had a great time. It was my first experience uh, on uh, Garfield Ridge. Um, I was kind of hoping for that to end fast. Yeah, it was done. Oh, I'll do it once more because I definitely want to do the Pemi Loop again. Um, see how it goes. Um, I will it was say a good time. I will never forget climbing up Garfield Ridge. You know, it's basically a waterfall. And looking back and seeing you two guys coming up, and like it was the most like visceral, like two faces of just misery going up Garfield Ridge. I was just, and we all had our moments, but I think when we got to Gilhead, you guys got your revenge because I remember this vividly too. It was like we went up Garfield Ridge, and oh, maybe it was after. Head. Either way, like you guys were able to sit on the front porch and dr- eat cookies and drink lemonade, and then I had to go hike up Gilhead to get that for my four thousand footer list. Right, and so you guys then had <laughs> yes, the, that's right. Had the 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 nice relaxing time, and I had the phase of misery, and then you guys had the phase of misery going up Garfield Ridge. But I have to say, sitting during a long trip like that is not the best thing to do because you just stiffen up. Well, with lemonade and cookies, though. Yeah, true, but you know what I mean? You just, like, yeah. stiffen up. I prefer to just... It's true, I yeah. am. I think I gassed out when we were approaching the final push to get up towards Lafayette. You know, when you start hitting the uh, the granite ledges, that's when I yeah. gassed out. And then God knows how we made it over to Flume. Um, and I rem- remember taking that really nice picture of you, Alvaro, with uh, the the ridge looking north just beyond you. It was like mm-hmm. a profile picture, really cool picture. Oh man! Yeah, I mean, just from uh, where I really felt it was, uh, once we leave Liberty and we start going to Flume, like we should be there already. This is insane. Why are we still going up so much? (laughs) Like we were so done with summits at that point. Um, but yeah, I would say after Lafayette, it started to be, you know, it's, it, it's not, now we're on a mission Correct. at that point. After Lafayette, we were just on a mission. Right. Yeah. It's a mind trip. Yeah, that was a fun day. It is. Yeah. Um, so Alvaro, last question for you, and then I want to switch over to Susie. So you, you're big into hiking for a long time, you're getting out there a ton, you're doing your 4,000 footers. I think you did like the... The six, did you do all the Adirondacks or did you just do all the Maine and Vermont? No, I have just don't, I have only done the 67. Okay, got it. So you yeah. did all yeah. that peak bagging, and then at a certain point, you decided teaching wasn't for you. And I remember talking to you sort of about like, you know, career changes and stuff like that. So you took a risk, made a career change. Um, but as I think as part of that too, like you haven't been able to hike as frequently. Obviously, COVID screws that up too. But you haven't been able to get out as much as you used to. Can Can you talk a little bit about that? Like at, at a certain point, like work and life sort of takes over you know where are you now as far as the balance between hiking and life or you know can you talk a little bit about that i would say that looking back is not so much work um i learned really quickly after i stopped teaching that uh i don't want work to rule my life and 
I make sure that I always have time to the things that I enjoy the most, uh, being being out there and the outdoors, um, hiking, different things that I want to be doing more and more. I would say that if there's a time that I'm not doing as much as I want, it's mostly due to you know social commitments, um, family gatherings, um, or moving from one you no. Know, one town to another um that can take time uh covid was definitely a, a point in, in in the past years that didn't allow us to do as much um but fortunately i think uh both susie and i are back at it again and we've been doing quite a few things in, in the past weeks and we have a few plans for the future weeks so that's great you know you're mentioning 67 i'm only three away to finish the 52 should be done before the end of august um just finished redlining um Nednik state park that was definitely a fun thing to do while the 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 price of gas is so high Nednik was close enough to just uh keep going there you know trying to be active and um, be out there not let myself just be at home and at work that's not the lifestyle that i like for myself nice yeah you gotta switch it up and then Susie, can you uh, enough with him let's talk about you um, <laughs> sorry Albert. So, exactly I'm, i know i'm boring oh, you could no, sorry good. <laughs> exactly. so Susie, can you talk a little bit about it so you got into hiking in like 2015 yeah readily admit like you sort of were like learning as you went along um and i know you found your crew as well yeah. but can you talk about how did you get into hiking and uh, talk a little bit about sort of that that journey that that got you into it and then how you transitioned into you know having a crew and completing the 4000 footers yeah so 2015 is kind of where it all started um so i a lot of people have the new year's resolution to you know quit drinking for the month of january dryuary mm-hmm. and i you know i you know Alcohol really wasn't doing me a lot of favors, and I thought that it would be a good time. It was a good excuse to basically, you know, for the month of January, see how I would do without drinking. And I go by a month, and, you know, I was feeling good, and I was like, okay, I'm going to let February, you know, see how February goes with the no drinking thing. I go a whole month of February. I mean, it's a short month anyway, so I survived. Um... And in March, I started to feel really um, down and out about myself. Um, I was sort of... It actually took a few weeks or months to figure out that I was actually covering up a lot of, you know, emotions, bad emotions with alcohol. And I discovered that I do not need alcohol anymore. But at the same time, I was trying to find some sort of, like, purpose in my life. Like, what's my journey? You know, like... Yeah. Well, that tendency in your personality to sort of need something to focus on. Like, if it's on alcohol, that's negative. But, like, you hear that a lot. Like, people pick up, you know, hiking or some other activity, right? Yeah. I I like to call it, like, a transfer addiction almost. Like... Mm. You need to divert that energy or that passion, I mean, be it whether it's alcohol or drinking, to something that's much more fulfilling, like hiking. Um, you, you need to have something to focus on, and I didn't have that in this weird gray area of my life in 2015. Um, but I would say around June, so six months, I started to f- level out and actually think coherently on what I want to do and what kind of got me into hiking was my birthday was in June so I went to Montreal and I was with my older brother and you know Montreal has this hill basically but they call it um, Mount Royal Um, and I was actually really shocked with myself and I, I surprised myself that I was able to go up this thing um, it's a hill but they call it a mountain 
Um, and I was blown away. I was like, wow, I can really do that. Like, I'm, I couldn't have done this like four years ago. Um, just so out of shape. And, you know, when you quit drinking, you lose a little bit of weight. And, mm-hmm. um, it really like opened my eyes. And I was like, is this something I could actually like do? Is this hiking thing? You know, it, um, I started to look into it more and, you know, I was hiking with a Fjall Raven backpack and, you know, sandals and cotton, you know. Um, I came back home from Montreal. I started looking up mountains near me because <laughs> I only knew about Mount Washington, you know, in the middle of 2015, I only knew about one mountain in New Hampshire and I discovered that Mount Mananoc was close by. I started, I, I got some local friends at the time, and they were interested in checking out Mount Mananoc, and I almost died going up, just being so out of breath, And but I, <laughs> sh- sure enough, I did it, and I, it was just, I think I started to become addicted to um, surprising myself, um, and I wanted to see how much more I could actually do. And basically test where my limits were. And so then I go to Mount Major and then my first 4,000 footer because I, I learned about this 4,000 footer list. And stupid me, because I didn't know anything at the time. Um, I did Tecumseh as my first one, which is fine. It's kind of a simple like first 4,000 footer. Mm-hmm. But the way how I wanted to tackle this list was, oh, isolation's next. That's the next shortest mountain. I could probably do it. That's not bad. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like elevation. But yeah. You're not thinking in terms of, okay, yeah. Yeah. Whoops. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I learned the hard way on when I tried to do uh, isolation um, <laughs> that, oh, it takes, you, there's a five mile trail prior to you know, getting onto the next trail that you need to be on to get to the summit of isolation. None of that clicked with me. Um, I didn't summit isolation that day, but you know, that was the hike where I realized, okay, these mountains can really kick your ass. And I'm, Mm -hmm. I think I'm addicted and I, I need to learn more about this. Um, I, um, I started doing these hikes by myself, um, or with some local friends and I think... So did you have, like, a home base in the Whites, or were you just driving up? I was just driving. Shore? Yeah, I was okay. just driving. Wow. I had um, I had a crappy little Ford Focus that was good on gas, so I didn't really care. Um, gas wasn't $4.50 a gallon, so I was just, you know, screw it. I'm going up every weekend. Like, I didn't see my family. <laughs> I feel like I didn't see them for, like, a whole year on the weekends, but I was just so addicted. And, um, when it came time to, so what I did Tecumseh and then I did white face, Paso Conway, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it was either end of October or beginning of November when I, it was time for me to do Tom Field and Willie. Um, didn't understand that days got shorter as it got closer to winter. (laughs) Uh, so I didn't have a headlamp, but that's okay. I'm not like that anymore. Um, and I will be the judge of that. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? What am I saying? Yeah. Uh, I, I started to do Tom Field and Willie by myself. Um, I was sort of one of the people where I would just kind of talk, you know, talk with people along the hike. Like I would just run into people and just talk, and I don't know. I thought it was. It was, like, sort of my way of trying to get to know what the whites were and who who lived in them. Mm -hmm. And so I did Tom. How's it go? Tom. And then Field. And on top of Field, there were two very approachable human beings on top. And there were a lot of Grey Jays. Um, And I've never seen the Grey Jays. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so magical. I'm a Disney princess. Yes, I was just like, oh, this is so cool. Someone get a photo of me, please. You know, and I I think (laughs) the Stomps, Mr. and Mrs. Stomp, um, were there. 
to uh, take a photo of me with the birds. And then yeah. you and I just started talking, and um, it, your wife was super cool. I think she had, like, an Eastman backpack and some, like, Timberland boots. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was, like... Basics, basics. Yeah, like, this is, like... <laughs> we're talking, so like, this funny. is 100 years ago, but, like, I, how much she knows now compared to then and same here is just, like, night and day. Yeah. Um... <laughs> But you were the one who said, hey, are you on any social media groups? Like, um, hike mm-hmm. the 4,000 footers of New England? Or I was like, no, I didn't even know that there were hiking groups. I was kind of just in this journey um, with myself for myself. I had no real plans of actually making friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I joined them, and I, you know, I saw that your name popped up and I was like oh uh, it was nice running into you and then you know you see other people and that's when you start talking to the other people in the groups and it kind of just mm. blossoms from there these these digital friendships yeah it, it's so interesting hearing you talk Susie because that's sort of like the same scenario with me and Stomp like I was a runner you know I ran Mount Washington and I knew Stomp and Mrs. Stomp from that and then I got into hiking a little bit I think I had done Mount Washington via Glen Boulder and then I had hooked up with with um, Stomp and Jimmy Chaga to go out to isolation on a winter hike because I had gotten into winter hiking a little bit I didn't know anything really yeah um, and then Stomp was like hey are you in any of these groups and I was like I don't know I'm not in any of these groups and then the rest is history so for the audience's sake what we're not really giving you the detail on is that these groups ended up becoming like, you know, like hiking buddies and all these other big networking groups are very common nowadays. Like that stuff was not going on. Like there was, I think the random group of hikers was a meetup group that was very structured. And I think Mike Blair ran that and, and, and some other folks and that was very structured and, you know, not really like a AMC led, but it was similar, like a lot of rules. Like there wasn't a lot of freewheeling, just connection groups going on um, at that time. So it opened up a whole world where there was like literally like dozens and, and hundreds of, of us that started connecting and building mm-hmm. relationships. And there was marriages that happened from this. And there's going to be babies that became of this. And there's, you know, all kinds of like relationships that have started and ended and, you know, friendships that began uh, because of this. And this podcast basically, you know, eventually ended up becoming what it is because I met, met Stomp. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing to look back at it now and see where we've come. Yeah. It's very bizarre because, you, I mean, today you can be a little, uh, not you, but in general, be sort of bitter towards how social media affects people um, in a negative way. Um, but it's also a blessing because if it wasn't for the groups and me running into Stomp on top of field, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have met any of you guys. So, um, and it feels like it was just yesterday too and I'm thinking like oh my god 2015 what was that like seven years ago now <laughs> yeah. oh my god <laughs> like, it's pretty amazing it is crazy um, but I, I'm i happy with where I am today and how far I've come and how much I've proven myself wrong um, and I, I always every time I go up there it's just it's it's pure joy for me. So yeah, and still finding time to put up with me—that's amazing. That's 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 a true that's a true accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That that's the tallest mountain. It is sure. It sure is. Yeah. And then so Susie, eventually you you've completed the four thousand footers, yeah. and then are you working on the fifty two with the views as well right now? Yeah, um, not. I think everyone has probably talked about COVID and how annoying it was, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so in the last couple of years, I kind of want a refund on my life. You know, I want yeah. those two years back. I, <laughs> I need I need to do some more hiking. I have I think this is the first year since probably 2019 where I've started to get back into it. You know, I don't know if you want to call it full time, but um, I am working on the 52 list. Um 
I think I have about 11 left. Um, okay. I know Alvaro has only like three or so left to do. Um, I did, I finished my 48 in a year. Um, and then I completed my 67, I think in a two year span. I, I mean, I was just really adamant about like seeing how much I could do and, um, yeah. And you've been, so you cranked out a lot of these mountains, but you also, more so than I think some other people that I, that I know, like you've dealt with injuries throughout hiking, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say in 2017 um, it was when I found out I have degenerative disc disease, which I think is a pretty common ailment but for someone my age it's not so common <laughs> I, have, I have to interject i have patients that, I, that call it de- degenerate degenerate did i say degenerate <laughs> no no oh, no okay. but I, I just like prompted that story i've had so many patients call it that i'm like oh degenerate disc disease <laughs> that's hilarious that's i might have great. to start calling it that that's um, awesome no, so I have I have degenerative disc disease, and I mean I was at a point where I basically was crawling on the floor to get from point A to point B, and um, hiking was definitely a struggle. Um, I mean I still did it because you know you we're kind of a stubborn type of people. Um, <laughs> you 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 need to go up there. You. you you weigh the pros and cons and you're like, well, it's better for my mental health and my physical health. You know, like I just got to do it. Um, but I I was really struggling and in in severe agony with the chronic back pain that I had for a few years. Um, but I more or less just put up with it. Um, which luckily currently it's not, um, terrible at all. Um, I, you know, I bought a a bigger car that has heated seats so I don't have to, like, bend down into it. You know, I splurge on a mattress. Um, it actually surprisingly really helped with the back pain. Okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, like, in that much pain right now, thankfully. Um, knock on wherever wood is around me, but... Mm. Um, well, so let me ask you guys this question. Is Alvaro going to wait for you, and are you both going to do your last 52 with a view together? So that was the original plan. Mm-hmm. Um, it was on Mount Success, right? Yeah, we wanted to finish on Mount Success. That's a good one. Yeah, I'm really excited to do that hike, um, especially I want to see the, the plane crash. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, um, but I think... Recently, maybe like a month ago, I told you, Alvaro, I was like, you know what, like, this is, like, you've been waiting too long for me because of, like, certain injuries that I've had, because I had foot surgery last year, too, you know, it's, um, I I said, Alvaro, I am completely fine with you finishing the list first, like, this is, I am not going to be butthurt about it whatsoever, um, Hall pass. <laughs> so he has three left, and we'll just, you know, he'll get it done, and then I'll get it done. It's not a big deal. I'll do those. I'll do those now, and I'll do those with Susie again. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's the nice thing about having hiked a lot of places. Like, it's not that big of a deal to go back to stuff. Right, right. Yeah. All right, Susie, this is the question that we all want to know, and I'm most excited. <laughs> okay. Can you give us your breakdown of, like, how did you meet... Alvaro and did he slide into your DMs? Did he like you know <laughs> run into you on a trail? Like, what's the deal? Oh God! Um, so I think this was obnoxious hikers, and um, it was you. It was Alvaro. It was me, and there was another friend, and we all needed the twins, um, and. It was Black Friday of 2015, and we all met up at the, um, I think it was the North Twin parking lot. Yep. And I remember seeing this cute little guy getting out of his Volvo, and, 
you know, I never was one to, like, date people. I don't know. I always was someone who just wanted to, like, wait for the right person to, you know, invest my time in a relationship with them. And for some reason, there was just something. I, I had a warm and fuzzy feeling. I was like, oh, my God, he's so cute. But I'm just going to, like, play, <laughs> I'm going to be a nice person and just see how this hike goes because we have, like, a... Yeah, yeah, you can't tip, you can't right. tip him off. Right. You play hockey. Like, this is, like, 8 in the morning. Like, it's yeah. too early in the day for me to be like this, you know. So I did the whole hike together. <laughs> we met... So basically, long story short, we met in the North Twin parking lot and we... Um, with another friend. She was not a third wheeler whatsoever because she was... Um, she was very supportive in wanting, I think, Alvar and I to pursue a relationship, at, you know, later on. Um, I think we took our time. Yeah. I, yeah well, I think it's more like a, as a, a friendship, but uh, it did develop. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as sliding into DMs, I think Alvaro slid into my DMs. Oh, okay. Right? I think so, but it wasn't like, <laughs> "Hey, babe, like you're so hot." Like, <laughs> no, no, she was fun in those groups, I, and, I, and I think that's what that's what got my, you know, my attention. She was quite a funny person, uh, with, with her comments on the hiking groups. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Not really holding back on anything whatsoever. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> nope. It's not really how I roll. And then the rest is history. So kind of, uh, yeah. It, it's um, every time it's Black Friday every year, we're like, oh, this was the day that we met. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's um, yeah, it was 2015, and it's sort of just picked up. And since you guys then. basically, like, for my, I mean, I know you hiked together quite a bit, but you for a long time, even when you were dating, I felt like you were still doing your own things as far as like, because Elvaro, you were doing a lot of stuff with Jeff at the time, and then Susie, you had your little crew yeah. Yeah. as well, so you weren't always just hiking together. It was No, we, we made it important, you know, that communication was definitely important, and that you know, if there was something that he wanted to do, I wasn't going to be like, well, babe, how come, like, you won't hike with me? It's like, okay, this is your goal. Like, go do your hike. I have my thing I need to do as well um, with whoever wants to come hike with me. And if we had a similar objective on a hike, we would go do the hike together. If not, then we would go do something else separately. And, I mean, I think that played a, a big part in us having such a good relationship as well. Is yeah, it does work out pretty yeah. well. I mean, we're like married, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do think we we hike together more now than than before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so oh, man. And then, uh, so eventually, you, so Susie, you, you, you landed him. You know, he, yeah. he finally, you know, you caught him, settled him down, yeah. and you know, you. Once you got married, like obviously, like the big trips to Europe are now in your future. Like, that's oh, bonus, yeah. right? I mean, we were going to Europe prior to the marriage, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. yeah. We, so we like to travel and we like to explore outside of the West, too, because there's obviously more to this this planet than just the White Mountains. And, yeah, um, there is, it was, I think so, you know, it's. <laughs> 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 what are you saying? Breaking news, stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but so can you, uh, can you, I want to get into some stories here. Yeah. So you guys are in, so you've talked about Scotland. How many times have you gone to Scotland, Alvaro? That was the first time. It, it was actually a trip that I've been wanting to do for a very long time, and it just felt right. Okay. You know, I think it was at the right time with the right person. It was perfect. It was definitely perfect. Yeah, when did you When did you go? So we we based basically in Fort William in the Highlands, and I'll say from there we went to a lot of places: uh, Glencoe, Isle of Skye. Um, 
we we also end up doing a, a little um, Monty Python uh, tour. I mean, we end up being in a lot of uh, a lot of the places uh, where the filming happened. So that was really cool, and that was actually one of the, one of Susie's goals. Um, That's awesome to go to those places. Yeah, cool. that was awesome. And was this was it this year or when did you go? It was uh, two months ago. Two months ago, yep. and then so Stomp told me you guys got in a situation like you had to rescue somebody on in the Highlands. What what happened? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I, and just before you get into the story, like I've watched some videos of like some crazy like search and rescue situations. Even though these mountains are like three thousand feet and they're not like that, I've seen like people that have like fallen down like these huge hills where they they look like they crash but they're really not but like there is some crazy weather that rolls in up there right yeah uh, i think being a weather yep. man in scotland is probably the worst job um <laughs> so we originally went to scotland with the objective to hike um ben nevis which is the highest peak in the uk i think or even just the british isles yeah um and when we got there, um, we kind of changed our plans a little because Ben Nevis was just a little too touristy for our taste. Um, mm-hmm. We will do it someday, but for our first time in Scotland, we kind of wanted something that was um, a little more, um, just less touristy because we, we are not really like sightseer, like touristy sightseer travelers. We wanted to go do something off the beaten path. Um, so the one hike or the one summit that we chose to hike was, um, the Munro is called Bukala Etif Mor, and, um, it's in Glencoe, which is just this gorgeous, like, hiking mountain haven, just, it, it's an outdoor paradise, it, it's beautiful, if if anyone whoever's listening like if you're thinking about going to scotland just do it like it is beautiful and um we chose bukula edif Mor, and it's kind of similar to i would say it's like a mini um knife edge like in baxter mm-hmm. um and when we so we get to the summit and it's beautiful and you know take our photos and just so happy elated and um, I don't know if this is where we want to segue into, like, the rescue. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. Um, so we were coming down, and the the trail that goes up and down is very easy to um, lose sight of because they don't really, they don't have markings. So we actually, for the first half of the hike going up, we didn't even know that we weren't on the trail the whole time. Um until we saw people coming down and there was like this like makeshift staircase that basically goes all the way up to the summit or up to the ridge line rather and so when we were coming down that staircase we saw a guy that was you know he was a bit older but in shape and he was running like hauling ass like he had his goal that day and it was to to basically go up Bukula Edifmor and run down he was wearing a vest um and so Alvar and I were just, you know, carrying on because it's very rocky. We didn't want to roll any ankles or anything. And we see a lady um, way in the distance, and she's sitting there with someone. And the lady had, uh, I think she was American, and she was like, are you guys... Um, do you, any of you have medical experience? And Alvaro has WUFA certification. I mean, I'm CPR certified, like, big whoop. But, like, we were like, yeah! Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we thought it was her. And going down further, we saw that she was with a guy. And it was the guy that ran past us. And... It appears that he got off trail because where he had fallen, it was... He basically went off trail and he slipped and fell at least 20 feet. Yeah, it was a 20-feet ledge. Yeah, and um, he he was 
confused. He, he, he was in really, really tough shape. And the lady who was there, she's like, I'm sorry, I can't stay here. Like, my husband and my kids, like, they had gone f- further down. Like, I was like, that's fine. Like, just go. Like, we'll take care of it. Um, so Alvaro and I were tending to this guy. And his leg was just bent in half. You could tell that he had, like, a a clean break fracture in his lower leg. And um, I think he might have um, broken his, either his shoulder or his elbow as well on his left side. And I think his hip was also injured. So we, when we found him, the position he, he was in, we believe that it was the position that he. So he fell. He slipped. He fell, and that was the position that he was in when he fell. So he he hadn't moved because I doubt that he could even move at that point. Um, so. Two other um, Scottish boys end up passing and stay there with us. They were in the group. They actually switched because the area where we were, there was no uh, no connection. So you couldn't call anyone um, for, for rescue. So someone ran down um, to make the phone call. So it was like basically the four of us, Susie, myself, um, and and these two boys. Uh, we were just attending to uh, t- to this person, or trying to um, to make him feel as comfortable as possible. Talking to him, gathering information as much as possible, just in case he would just go out we'd have information for the rescue team um but at the same time trying to make him you know talk to us not fall asleep at all um but he was definitely he was responsive but um definitely not in in good shape it would take him a while to answer something if if he would uh and i think so you were there for like what 50 minutes with him basically we were there for about an hour i think in total he was there for two hours um oh yeah help and um i mean I had my hiking poles with me, so I made sure that we made um, a makeshift splint to just hold his leg in a straight position. Like, Mm -hmm. it was just, it was pretty gross. Um, I asked him, you know, what day it is, what's his name, what's his age. Like, he could only answer one question, so I was a little nervous that he was going to nod out of consciousness. Um, But I... You know, I mushed up some uh, granola bar. I fed it to him because he wanted to eat. So he was like, I just wanted to keep him occupied with making sure that he wasn't going to, you know, fall asleep. Um, but the we didn't know what to call, like, because you're in uh, Scotland, so it's not 911. So that's something that's a good tip when you're traveling internationally. Try to know what, like, their local um, emergency rescue number is because you would think, oh, it's 911, but it's not like that in every country. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, So the two Scottish guys that were sitting with us, um, I I believe they were able to get in touch and, and call, I think it's 999 in Scotland. And... That's when the Glencoe Mountain Rescue, I think it took them about maybe 45 minutes to come out and finally get this guy out of here. Yeah, initially initially was a group of two people, uh, the very first uh, responders. And I think from that point, they had satellite um, phones, so they were able to... Um, get the helicopter there they had ambulances waiting um because we we were actually just like well one and a half mile i would say from from the trailhead but it's but it's it, it's all rocky it's like trying to come down uh, king's ravine for example um but just the 
in the boulder section. Yeah. So at, at that point, there was no way they, they could, um, in this condition, they could not just carry him um, through the trail. So they they definitely have to. In the helicopter? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Did you guys hang around for when the helicopter got there? Yeah, we were yep. there for the oh, whole wow. thing. Um, I mean, we had to be there because uh, my my backpack was supporting his leg. Her poles were the splint. Uh, also, her backpack was kind of his pillow, and we were using everything we could uh, to to help this guy. Wow. And we we haven't talked about this, Alvaro, but like you have experience as a professional guide, so can you talk a little bit about that that experience? You know, it's interesting. Never had to um, use any of these uh, skills while guiding, thank God, because um, being a mountain guide, you definitely carry that responsibility. Even when the person that is with you, the person that you're guiding, uh, and, and I had that a lot of times, it was more for the company, so they are not out there alone. A lot of them were quite capable uh, but they were coming f- uh, from uh, a, a different state. They didn't, don't know the area that well. So having those services were definitely uh, a plus. So having that person uh, with them, with knowledge, in case something happens, they were capable to, to assist on the spot. Um, so I'll, I would say that was one of the very interesting things about you know um, guiding, uh, making sure that I had enough knowledge to be that person um, that could, in, in situation, uh, help. But um, also, you know, showing off the the beauty uh, we have here in in New England. I would say um, most uh, most of the of the guides that I had were from people from New York. Um, like two funny stories, actually. Uh, one of them, uh, afraid of heights, <laughs> and we did quite. We did. I got him like two or three times. Uh, once, we actually couldn't summit because he couldn't move past one section uh, because it, w- it was too close from a ridge, so he could not. Uh, he was li- literally blocked he couldn't go further and it was interesting because i was hoping to also get um my winter summit of that place and i couldn't because of that <laughs> <laughs> I, I had been there before but not uh in in snow conditions um so yeah it, it was a shame but i mean it's where even when you're not guiding you are hiking with a group, you start together, you finish together, and that's how it should be. We hear so many stories of uh, people, groups that start hiking, and uh, two hours after, one is already a mile uh, away, the rest of the group is back, and usually that's when a lot of stuff happens. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, being a guide, um, helped me with a lot of more knowledge that, that at the know I became a, a wilderness first responder. Uh, I did some avalanche uh, certification, and, and all of that comes into place. Even if we don't have to use it, which is a good sign, um, a lot of things always stay there, and they do trigger, um, at least some of them, they do trigger in case of emergency. So it's always good to um, do these things at least once, and if you can um, recertify, uh, it's not a bad thing at all. Yeah, yeah. And then the one thing I wanted to ask you, Alvaro, for another story is we had had Jeff Rogers on to talk about um, a bunch of his adventures, but um, we had covered the um, situation where you guys found a father and son in Maine. Uh, can, can you recap that story again? Because I still like that to me is one of the craziest um, stories that I've, I've heard, you know, of, of any of my hiking friends. Yeah. Um, so Jeff and I, we were we were on a um, back backpacking trip in Maine. Uh, we, were, we were staying with Abrams, then I think Spalding, Sugarloaf, and the Crockers, um, and we decided to do the first mile and just camp on the side of the trail uh, away. Um, at, at night, so we got to the, um, I think I'll say it was midnight when we got to the trailhead. Uh, we basically were playing for that mile. 
um, and then the next day just continue. I would say probably about half mile in. So this is midnight. It's dark, and it, it was it, I was it was either cloudy or was not full moon at all. So you, if you didn't have a lamp, you couldn't see anything. And at some point, we we hear someone saying, uh, "Are you looking for us?" And I mean, we thought, well, these are probably guys that are either camping, having fun, or just like, you know, <laughs> trying to prank people. Uh, we kept we kept walking, and at the, at some point, we do see two people on the side of the trail, and we noticed there was this this gentleman, and we we found out after his son. Um, they had been there since seven. So at the time, the time of the year, by seven, it, it was dark, and they were that close from the trailhead. But because they didn't have a headlamp or any other light source, they they couldn't continue without getting lost. So they just, they just decided to stay right next to the to the trail, and they were you know hugging each other. They didn't ha- all, they didn't have as well I know um, enough clothes to keep them warm in case something like that happened. Um, so we basically ended up just uh, you know take take them back to the trailhead. We provide them some uh, uh, some clothes to uh, to warm up. We could we could tell the kid was already um, cold and he was definitely not. No, the warmest, um, and it was not. It, it was definitely not the warm night. I would say we were in in the low forties that night. So if you have shorts and a t-shirt and you just have there's only like one light puff, that, that might not might not ugh, sorry, might not be enough um, you know, to hold you throughout the night. So we don't know if the kid would be in good shape by the morning, to be honest. Yeah, that's so, what Jeff said. Is he was like, it's pretty likely that they would have they had to deal with hypothermia if they had to start. Oh, yeah, definitely. You two crazy lunatics deciding to go up there early, like pretty much save those guys. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, you know... Providence. Sometimes someone's, someone's crazy idea... Um, might be the the lifesaver of other people. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's All right, true. we're getting we're getting to the end here. So, um, Susie, we need two quick stories from you. One is winter hike with Mrs. Stomp, and then also we need you to recap the first time you met me and came over to uh, Brownfield to do a little bit of a an overnight camping deal. So, Stomp wants to hear both of these. Okay. Um. <laughs> So earlier I was talking about isolation and, you know, totally not understanding isolation and how much more difficult it is, especially if you're hiking in cotton without a a headlamp, blah, blah, blah. Um, Come winter time, so I think it was maybe December or January of 2016, um, Mrs. Stomp... (laughs) who was now becoming quite a good hiker friend. Um, She and I were like, you know, how badass would we be if, like, we did isolation in the winter and, like, it'd be so pretty up there. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, We knew what micro spikes and headlamps were at this stage of our lives. Um, But we didn't know what snowshoes were. Um... (laughs) And, um, we, we really were interested in doing the, um, I guess the engine hill bushwhack, which isn't really a bushwhack. It's just like, almost like a hurt. It's just like a winter tree. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's really beautiful. Um, just like the, the birch trees everywhere. Um, but we thought, oh, this is like kind of like a good shortcut. Cause we're looking at a map thinking we're so cool. Like, um, like we're navigators, like we're hiking in the winter. We're two like strong females. Like we got this, and we do the engine hill bushwhack without snowshoes, and we're post holing up to our thighs for probably two hours. Um, it 
it was just like, I mean, we were laughing our asses off at the same time because, I mean, the weather was nice, you know, luckily it wasn't like snowing out that day. Yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> I learned to get snowshoes after this hike, basically. Um, isn't that the, isn't that the conventional wisdom though, to avoid the crossings, not necessarily in winter, but during high water for sure. <sighs> Yeah, you know, I think I think there was another motive behind us doing the the Engine Hill bushwhack also. Um I think it was because of the crossings. Um we were reading that the ice bridges formed over them weren't really structurally sound yet. Yeah. Um but Doing the doing the engine hill route, I mean, without snowshoes, is exhausting. So mm-hmm. I mean, both ways, not very safe. I mean, we we did it. We did the hike. We got to isolation and went back the same. I don't think we went back engine hill. <laughs> um, Stable. Yeah. Probably because we you know we broke trail. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, deep snow. It's exhausting, which probably would have been easier because it was tamped down. Uh, so, so on my end, there have been only two times where I have almost pulled, pressed the button, pulled the cord on Mrs. Stomp because I was nervous for her safety, and this is one of them. You guys, like literally, it was getting really late at night, and I hadn't heard a peep. And just when I was going to probably start making some calls, I get a text from her of just her. It was like a selfie with Mount Washington in the background. I was like, oh, thank God. But it was, you know, it just goes to show you. It's like, wow, what an arduous day you guys had that day. Oh, yeah, it was brutal. It was brutal. But it was fun. And I'm just, again, I want to impress upon everyone that I am not like this anymore. (laughs) Like, this is old, old Susie. Um, I've learned quite a bit since then. I've, you know, logged a fair fair amount of miles. Yeah. Um, but, you know, live and learn. <laughs> no, I mean, the best hikes are the ones where you somehow struggle for some reason. There's something that, it's, that shouldn't happen, and it happens. And those are the stories that you'll remember uh, after. Yes. <laughs> As have we all. Problem solving, you know, coming up with some adversity that the group has to figure out or you have to figure out. It's it's makes the memories even that much more uh, stronger. Who took a squad shot? Yeah, I was I was just taking a photo as we were talking here. Yeah, so. but now I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about no, that. No, no, it's funny because now I can't see anyone. This is funny. Oh, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Where did everyone go? I don't know. We're here. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, it should bring you back. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. That's um, hilarious. No, I still right. can't see anyone. Oh shit. Oh well. I won't try I won't do that again. <laughs> that's okay. Anyway, well, um Yeah, so I think that's it for you guys. Anything we missed? Anything else you want to add before we move on to search and rescue stuff? Mike, how did we meet in Brownfield? I'm trying to remember if it was in brownfield where we met for the first time i think so i think i i had the dumb idea of like inviting all you crazy people over to nan and papa's beach yes <laughs> and uh yeah i think well i saw you driving on the highway one time i remember um seeing you on the highway because you had the you know you had like some of the bumper stickers that sort of signal that yeah. were in the group and yeah um but i think that was the first time that we met and then yeah that was sort of like the culmination of like everybody knew each other over social media and had hiked a little bit and then I think that you guys had always done your sort of your your get togethers I had never gotten a chance to go Mm -hmm. so I had hosted one I may have met you out on the PEMI one time I don't know I might have I ran out and I think so you guys were camping on the PEMI one time I think so yeah you had a couple get togethers um yes and I mean I, I had some fun then um because you i remember you had some kayaks or some canoes and i took one of them out and i remember standing on top of one of the kayaks too and i was like oh i'm so cool because i'm not falling um 
I, I don't know if that was yeah. the first And I remember one, Karen it, fell in. Did Karen Karen fall? Did okay. I was like, yes, I was like yes. Fell. Okay. Yeah, which made which made that was the best part of the weekend. We all had such a good time there, so <laughs> Um, that was fun. You had a couple get togethers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to do that again. We do. Maybe, maybe we'll do that again this fall. That'll be good. It'll be more like an adult get together. It'll be a little less wild. I think. Yeah. Grown up a little bit. Yeah. And I remember seeing you the next day, and I was like, "This is why Mike is such a dad." Like this was like a thought that I had, and I, for some reason, yes. and I, you were raking your <laughs> sand. Yes. Like, like a Japanese just to garden. Make it look pretty. It was like. Um, <laughs> It was like one of those like Zen gardens. Yes, yes. I was like Zen Mike. Rake it did look hands. pretty after. It's so. Sad. It looks beautiful after. Know, it is. Like, yeah. You did a great job raking your sand. Like good job. Yeah. And it's so devastating when someone like steps on it afterwards. I, I didn't oh, want to no. go near the rake sand. I was like, this guy's in his element. I'm not going to disturb. Yeah, exactly. Now you understand. That, yeah. Right? Exactly. All right, well, it's been great catching up with you guys. Hang out. We're going to do um, a couple of short search and rescues here, and you can give your comments, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Stomp, um, first thing to call out is the next... I was up on Mount Washington Saturday. Next morning, we got we saw over social media that, like, there was a there was a car fire on Mount Washington. So they had some sort of a sunset, like, drive up there. And um, there was one... I'm assuming one car lit, uh, caught on fire and then ended up... Um, it was probably windy. And then I the guess. other two cars got set on fire as well. So three cars got destroyed. They had to get, like, Gorham Fire Department up there to, like, put these things out. So... Yeah. I don't know if there's anything more to it. But. Yeah, the cars were adjacent to each other. I mean, the whole thing is strange. Like, what, what ignited the first one? But uh, that's mm. pretty unusual. Um, yeah, uh, looking at pictures, they were directly next to each other. At first, I was thinking, are these three separate cars in three separate locations? And then it made more sense as more information came in. But yeah, three yeah. cars scorched up on Mount Washington. Yeah, it's crazy. So we'll put some photos of the, the cars on... Uh, um, we already have some, but I'll add some to the show notes too, some links. So it's pretty crazy. Um, and then the next story here is, um, a rescue on Kinsman Ridge. So this was on Friday. Uh, fishing game was notified of a hiker that suffered a lower leg injury while climbing Kin- Kinsman Ridge trail. Uh, gentleman was um, 54 year old from Andover, Mass. So he had prepared to go on a solo hike starting from the base of Cannon Mountain. He was going to hike to the summit and return via the Kin- Kinsman Ridge Trail. On the way up, he slipped on a rock and fell backwards and injured his leg. He was able to call 911 after the call, and then Pemi Search and Rescue activated a team. Uh, to assist with carrying this gentleman down to safety. So due to the where he was, they decided to bring him uphill across the mountain to a ski trail. And then from there, they were able to get a, a, um, a utility vehicle up to uh, to bring him down the, the remainder of the portion. So they must have determined that like it was easier to actually bring him to the open ski trails to get to him versus hiking him down the narrow trail. So. Kinsman Ridge Trail is um, in really rough shape these days, and it's not, uh, even over falling waters, it's probably the worst trail in the region for a rescue. So this person was at about 3,400 feet, and that's where there's that sharp 90-degree angle that leads up to the, the first overlook. And at that point, I think by default, what what's going to have to happen is if somebody is in that vicinity at that elevation, then the best route and the easiest route is to actually go over the old ski trail that leads pretty much under the tram. And then from there, uh, depending on the season, but I mean, for the team, it was pretty straightforward, just sliding the individual down the grassy slopes instead of even having to carry. So it was pretty convenient in that sense down to the Peabody Lodge and uh, from there, a, uh, a UTV gator was able to pick up the individual. So, pretty neat. But, uh, yeah, you know, you hear rumblings about AMC um, getting this grant to fix some of the trails. I don't know if Kinsman Ridge Trail is on that list or not. I, uh, I hope it is. It's in rough shape. It's actually becoming 
sort of dangerous in my opinion. There were these like giant boulders in the middle of the trail that seemed to be holding on by a piece of dirt, like literally just very little bit of earth holding some of these big rocks that could let loose, it would hmm. seem. So be careful if you guys are heading up there. It's the it's the it's probably the quickest way up to Cannon, but it's a little sketchy. Is that the way that we went when, when we did my finish hike, or did we go up uh, High Cannon? High Cannon. All right, so different trail. Different challenge, a little steeper. Interesting. But, um, yeah. Well, that's all we got. Uh, before we close out, I want to tell you guys one thing. So I'm, I'm scheming. I'm going to do a, like a, a, an overnight backpacking trip. I think we're going to, like August 12th and 13th, I'm going to be doing a Pemi loop with um, my wife's cousin. So we're scheming right now. And I was just out of curiosity. I was like, well, I wonder how much it would be to stay at Galehead for the night on Saturday night. How much do you think it is for one night in the hut? Is it over 200 these days? Like 200, I would think. Keep going. Shut up. Wow. 310 for membership. Wow. For, you- for one night? For one night. For one night, yeah. On the, yeah, Saturday night. I was, I was That's surprised. Just- for a member? God. I remember when it was for members. Yeah, for members. I remember when it was one hundred for non members. Yeah. And wow. it's, um I mean they do I mean it's dinner, breakfast, so um, you know, and a place to sleep. So it's not it's not like it's just a place to lay your head down. You do get, you know, some additional stuff, but it's it's getting up there. So they must I <laughs> mean they incredible. must have people paying them. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. And I looked, I was like, Well what if I went in on like a, a, a Wednesday night in like September after school starts. So that was like two fifty, I think. So even even their like sort of like off off season prices are pretty expensive. But I do want to go. I've never been to an AMC hunt. I wanna got wanna book a night. They are fun. I mean yeah. I, I did a Southern Prezi just like um how did I do it? I did I stayed in Mizpah and then the next night I stayed at Lake of the Clouds. And, it, it, I mean, I did it basically just because Alvaro was, I think that was when you were in California doing yeah. pasta. Um, and I was like, you know, I have some time to kill. I'm just gonna, I don't want to carry a tent. Like, I'm just going to kind of glam this up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I stayed in Mizpah. I stayed at Lake of the Clouds. And it was, I mean, they're nice. Um, it wasn't three hundred. I didn't pay three hundred dollars a night. Like that's bizarre. I I thought I did overpay. I think it was like one fifty a night. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of didn't care. Um, they're nice, and if you can, you know, stay in one just at least once or twice if you can. But I mean, if it's three hundred dollars, like that's not that's not nice to a lot of people that you know want to <laughs> utilize the huts. Um, yeah. not it's a lot of money. It's almost. I mean, my experience in Spain was it to be probably nowadays seven times less in a similar in a similar um, setup. Got it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, hopefully they're paying the crew really well. And, yeah. And that's you know if they're doing that, then I guess it's it's fine. And matter of fact, yeah. as I was coming down Mount Washington, one of the crew members was hiking up to the observatory with their backboard, and like it's insane. Oh, those kids. They're doing amazing work. Back yeah. Beasts. With they are. Well, it's probably 80, 100 pounds they're carrying up. It's crazy. It's, a, oh. it's insane. Yeah. So anyway, just get your wallet out if you're going to stay in the AMC huts. Yeah. But that's it. That's all we got, folks. So uh, thank you so much, Alvaro and Susie. And <laughs> keep us updated on the 52 with a view. I want to go to one of your finishes. And, yeah. You know, st- yeah. Did we miss anything else? No, I think we could have talked for hours and hours and hours. Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do a part <laughs> two sometime or another. But yeah. yeah. Love you guys. And we'll uh, we'll fun. get out and hike hopefully soon this uh, summer. Yes. Yes. Thank yep. you so much. It was great to be here with you guys. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. 
We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Nealon, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared, and I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.